Supreme Court is back in the news. We had a long list of new orders come out yesterday. I want to show you a quick screenshot of one that we're going to get into here quickly. This is the Edward versus uh, Strom case, Edward Coniglia versus Strom. This is from the petition for cer uh, certiorari, the brief for the petitioner. And this is a case where Edward Coniglia was sort of in an altercation with his wife. Cops came after the fact, and they ended up going into his house and essentially taking his guns away. The question then was, were they allowed to do that? Were they allowed to go into the house? And if so, under what principle? What authority did they have to do that? Because we all know that the Fourth Amendment says that your right to be, you know, free from unlawful, unreasonable searches and seizures in your home. We're supposed to be protected in our homes. Cops are supposed to get warrants or ask your permission or identify some exigent circumstances that allow them to get into your home. A lot of case law. Supreme Court has said the home is sacred. So when these police in the Coniglia, Coniglia case went into his house and kind of took his gun away, what basis did they have to do that? What was their justification for that? Well, they leaned on this concept called community caretaking. It's this exception that some uh, 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 circuits, I, have a brain, I lost the, my train of thought there, some circuits in the United States, we have different circuits of federal courts that tell us how the law works in that particular circuit. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you what that means here in a minute. But in this case, in this circuit, in this location, they said that a police officer can go into your house and they can use this community caretaking exception to do so. They don't need a warrant. They don't need exigent circumstances. They just, if they have a kind of a good reason to do so and it's under the community caretaker, I'm just part of the community. I'm just here to caretake. Then you can come on into, your, into the house. This is something that has existed for vehicles, right? Prosecutors and police use this all the time for vehicles. They say, well, we're just going to pull you over as part of our community caretaking exception. You didn't do anything wrong, really, but we're just going to try to stop you and sort of investigate it because we're just taking care of the community. And the courts have said that's no problem at all. So now the question was, does that doctrine extend into the home? Big question. And you know, people like me, you know, civil, civil people, people interested in civil liberties and the Constitution and you know, sort of the concerns that we have over an over encroaching government. We were all on high alert over this case, because if this were to have gone the other way, then basically the cops could have just said, well, whatever, we can just the same reasons that we can pull you over. We can get into your house. Oof, scary stuff. This is what the question was. Saoirse Rory was granted last year, November 20th, 2020. The question was whether the community caretaking exception to the Fourth Amendment's warrant requirement extends to the home. So can they use this exception to get into your house? This is how the circuit was split previously. So the question was, does the community caretaker exception extend to the home? There were many circuits that said, yeah, it does. First circuit said, yep, no problem. Fifth circuit said, yep, they can come on in, invite them for dinner. A circuit also said, yeah, cops are very welcome. Third circuit, seventh circuit, ninth circuit, and 10th circuit, they all said no. No, that, no, we're not going to allow that to happen. And so we had a couple circuits that just didn't give us any answers. Second circuit, no answers. Fourth, no answers. Sixth, no answers. And so the Supreme Court came in and they said, well, we got to clear this up. We have a circuit split. You can see that these circuits sort of break up the country, right? So if we have one, five, and eight, we have one over here, we have five down here, and we have eight over here. So we got North Dakota, sort of the Midwest, we got Texas, and you know some of these uh, Southern states. And then we have the North East all saying cops can come on in, no problem. Then we have the others saying, no, we got the third, seventh, ninth, and 10th. So we got the third over here, seventh here, ninth, and then the 10th. So the good Western part of the country saying no, 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 no to the, to the police, Chicago land, and some of New York and Pennsylvania, uh, that, that circuit here, all saying cops cannot come in. So this case came down and it was in fact unanimous. That means all the judges voted in favor of making sure that this does not stand. You're gonna see here the vote by ideology going from the left to the right. So from liberal to conservative, we got Sotomayor, Kagan, it goes all the way down to Thomas, every single one of them, including the new Amy Coney Barrett. We have Chief Justice Roberts, who's perfectly right there in the middle, which is a good place for him. And they all voted. Nope, doesn't apply. They cannot get into your home using the caretaker exception. Very, very good news. Let's take a little bit of a deeper dive. It was a unanimous ruling and a reminder that there is, in fact, no place like home. Monday, Supreme Court released their opinion, unanimously held the lower court's community caretaking exception into the home. They say that defied logic, and it defined, defied the holding of Katie, 
as well as it violated the Fourth Amendment warrant requirement. With the court's unanimity, the home remains the most sacred space under the Fourth Amendment. Its sanctity literally houses its privilege. Without a warrant, without exigency, or without consent, the government search and seizure with inside, within it is unconstitutional. So it's very good news. This happened back during an argument with Coniglia. He offered her one of his unloaded guns. We're not going to read through all this. This is, uh, this is what, so there was an argument. This is kind of an elderly couple from my reading of it. Get into an argument, husband, wife, he says, well, how about I just shoot myself? Or how about I just kill myself, right? Takes a gun, I think it's unloaded, slams it down there. Wife freaks out. So he slams the gun down, he leaves, goes to a hotel, she calls the cops, cops come back, they do a wellness check, uh, and basically he, he talks to the police and says, and says uh, I'll leave, I'll go to a, a, a mental wellness evaluation, but only if you don't take my guns and take anything that's in my house. Well, guess what? They did. They took it all. And so he ended up suing them and he won big time. So the good news court's opinion was written by judge Clarice Clarence Thomas was devoid of the fearsome, compelling specter raised in the briefing and during an argument regarding the potential for troubling eventualities. Uh, as always with realty courts, fourth amendment jurisprudence location matters. They say the location of the warrantless search and seizure Government searches of vehicles regularly occur with, via exceptions. They say under the caretaking exception under Katie is not under is not carte blanche for police to seize or search within the home. Very good. Police may engage in civic community caretaking functions. Uh, didn't move the court. The court vacated the First Circuit's judgment, sent the case back to the lower court for further proceedings. Chief Justice Roberts, Alito, Justice Kavanaugh, each wrote a brief concurring opinions to clarify what they described as the limits of the court's ruling. So good news. You know, typically conservative judges are very pro-police, right? And this has been something that I've been very critical of that for a long time. I don't know why they, they are very protective or concerned about an over encroaching big government unless it's law enforcement. Then the cops are just without fault, no matter what they do. So that has largely been how conservative jurisprudence has been, but not here. Can't go in your home. Very good news. Very good outcome. Glad it went that way. We also have another slight ish criminal. Yeah, this is a criminal law case we have here. This says justices are divided on a retroactive application of the jury unanimity rule. So we have a rule now that came out from the Supreme Court back in 2020. Let me show you this. Supreme Court in 2020 said criminal juries must be unanimous in order to convict. So they ruled this back April 20th, 2020. They said that juries in a state criminal trial must be unanimous to convict a defendant, settling a quirk of constitutional law that has allowed divided votes to result in convictions in Louisiana and Oregon. And so they went through this. They said Neil Gorsuch wrote that the practice is inconsistent with the right to a jury trial. It should be discarded as a vestige of Jim Crow laws. It was basically, you know, sort of birthed out of bigotry and racism. Basically what was happening out of, you know, Louisiana and some of these places is that back in the 1930s and um, since in Oregon in 1930s, but they would, you know, they, they, they would charge somebody, let's say a black guy with a crime, right? And they'd have a jury, 12 people would be on there. Well, 10 people would be white, two people would be black and the black people would say, well, no, we're not going to, we're not going to convict this person. So what do you have? Well, if you have a unanimous requirement for a verdict, well, that person doesn't get convicted. So a lot of these legislatures said, oh, it's fine. We'll just say it doesn't have to be unanimous anymore. So if, if it's 10 to 2, well, that's fine. So then you get a, enough room there that you can get some unfavorable jurors on there. Absolutely insane to me that this was even ever allowed to happen. I mean, we have a concept in our jurisprudence here called beyond a reasonable doubt. And if you have a split jury, kind of sounds like the definition of reasonable doubt to me, right? You got two jurors who say, I don't see it. It's the definition of it. But a lot of these states for, for some time were saying, yeah, you could, no problem, right? If you have two people who say not guilty, doesn't matter. You need three. For a defense attorney, it's like the worst nightmare. You might as well not even try because it's just ridiculous. So, so now we know that in 2020, the Supreme Court said, can't do that anymore. And to be fair, most states around the country you know, never sort of ascribed to this type of modality, but it was still something that was floating around in our jurisprudence for some time. Well, that happened in 2020. So the question was, well, what about the people who had already been convicted? 
What about if I was convicted in 2019 and I had a split jury conviction? They came out, two people said I was not guilty. Can I apply that 2020 case to my case that was in 2019? Maybe reopen it, get a new trial, have them dismiss my case. What's going on? Can I, can I, can I try again? Because you just came out and said, this is a problem. This is a vestige of Jim Crow. So I want another crack at it. Can I do it? The court said, no, you can't. Sorry. No retroactive application. They ruled, of course, in a vote of six to three, purely political again. So all the conservative judges voting in favor of not extending that rule, all of the liberal judges voting in favor of extending it. So making it retroactive, which, of course, I would have loved to have seen it be made retroactive, but I wouldn't have held my breath that that was going to happen. The geographical impact of the decision is limited to Louisiana and Oregon, the only two states that have allowed non-unanimous verdicts. So the dispute over this went, goes back almost 50 years. There was a 1972 ruling in Apodaca versus Oregon, holding that although the Sixth Amendment guarantees a right to a unanimous jury in federal cases, but that does not apply in state cases. So the justices were deeply divided in reaching that conclusion. Four of them would have ruled. All right, it goes on and on and on. We know what the verdict is here, so it's not going to go backwards. We have in 2020, Ramos, we already talked about that case. It was a 6-3 to three case. The court's ruling drew a sharp dissent from Justice Elena Kagan, who is this judge right here. So Judge uh, Elena Kagan, we have a majority opinion coming from these conservative judges. Judge K uh, Kagan wrote a dissent. Let's see what that says. She said here, Kagan suggested that the jury unanimity requirement was so clearly a watershed rule that the majority was left with little choice other than to scrap the watershed exception altogether. And it did so. Kagan contended, even though no one had asked it to do so and without any good reason to do so, the majority, Kagan said, crawls under rather than leaps over the bar created by the principle that the court should normally adhere to its prior precedent. All right, so she's upset over some precedential stuff, it sounds like. The Supreme Court is also going to be hearing a challenge to Roe versus Wade. And this is going to be interesting. This is, um, we're going to see when, the, when this actually hits the court docket. I'm very curious about this. Think about the timing now on all of this happening. And I haven't really thought through the timing on this uh, specifically. Like, I don't know the dates and when this is all going to unfold. But I want you to think about this in terms of practicality. Okay, Roe versus Wade is one of the most contentious cases ever in the history of anything. And it is something that has become even bigger than really the legal case. It's kind of a symbol for, you know, women's rights and women's freedoms and, and, and sort of, I guess, women largely, you know, at least one content, one, one segment of women. I know many women are uh, disgusted by Roe versus Wade, but it, it has become almost symbolic. It's sort of identified very closely with Planned Parenthood and a lot of these big women's rights organizations. And so many people, Anytime it's Roe versus Wade, you know, it's sort of this assault on women, meaning that this is going to be a big deal. So the question then becomes, what is the Supreme Court going to do about this? And I want you to think about this in terms of political posturing, not even about the law, not even about abortion, not even about, you know, uh, any any legal concerns you have about the structure of Roe versus Wade or about, you know, the, the opinion on life at conception or any of that stuff. It's not even about that. It's about what the court is going to do based on the political posture. So let's think about this. If the Supreme Court came out today and overturned Roe versus Wade today, they're not going to do that today because this case is going to come up on the next cycle, uh, it sounds like. If they did that today, guess what would happen, right? You would see a ton of political pressure and a lot of momentum from the Democrats, and the court would almost certainly be packed because there would be almost no way to stop that enthusiasm for changing this case. But what happens if we fast forward to next year when we're in the second term? Maybe we don't hear a ruling or we get an outcome on this case until after the midterms. Well, what happens if the seats change? What happens if the Senate changes back to Republican control or the House changes back to Republican control? Well, then it's a lot more difficult for the threat of court packing to have any teeth because the Democrats are no longer in control. They can't do that. And of course, the Republicans are not going to allow that to happen. So we, we now sort of see how this can flesh itself out in terms of politics. If the Supreme Court comes back down and rules in favor of overturning Roe, well, maybe we get a lot more calls for court packing. If they don't, you're going to have a lot of people very disappointed that we have six conservative judges. We have an opportunity now to potentially readdress what many people consider to be a massive problem in our jurisprudence and our cultural society 
in the in through the through the lens of Roe versus Wade. Well, Supreme Court's going to hear about it. They have on Monday accepted a Mississippi challenge to the abortion precedent set by Roe versus Wade. This comes over by from the Washington Examiner. In an unsigned order, the court said it would hear the case, but limited its scope to the first question presented in the petition, which is whether, quote, all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. The court will not consider the other two questions, which related to the scrutiny of abortion restrictions. The court's acceptance of the case electrified the anti-abortion movement, with many leaders hoping it would signal the end of a decades-long battle to send the abortion question back to the individual states. The states should be allowed to craft laws that are in line with both public opinion on this issue as well as basic human compassion instead of the extreme policy that Roe imposed, said Jeannie Mancini. In a petition, uh, Mississippi Attorney General Lynn Fitch asked the court to consider if the state's 2018 law banning abortions before 15 weeks is constitutional. So it sounds like that's what the law is, right? If there was a law in 2018 that banned abortions before 15 weeks, Fitch wrote that the court must resolve contradictions in its decisions over when viability begins. So they're asking the Supreme Court to weigh in on that. Now, that the, the question, the issue that the court's going to be trying to unpack is, are all pre viability prohibitions on elective abortions unconstitutional. So is it unconstitutional to say at 15 weeks, I know almost nothing about pregnancies, but at 15 weeks, you are absolutely not even remotely viable. Pretty sure, pretty sure about that one, that there's no way you can survive if you're a 15 week fetus. And so here they're saying, that you that this would be banned before 15 weeks. All right, whether that's constitutional or not. Well, we're going to see what the Supreme Court says about this. The case represents the latest challenge to the abortion precedent by Roe, reaffirmed in 1992 by the Casey decision. Last summer, the court weighed in on a major abortion case in Louisiana where Roberts joined the court's liberal wing to deal a blow to anti-abortion activists. The addition of Amy Coney Barrett to the court gave the anti-abortion movement hope that cases such as the Mississippi might prove winnable. Both sides of the abortion debate after Barrett's confirmation ramped up their preparations for the possibility of a post-Roe future. The court wrestled behind the scenes for nearly a year before agreeing to hear arguments in the case. And so we'll see where that comes up in the court queue, the court docket. Let's take a look at some questions here from watchingthewatchers.locals.com. What's up, Sharon Quitney here? She says, well, what do you know? Wonders never cease. The Supremes who were and remain worse than useless during the election debacle actually upheld citizens' rights and the Constitution, and unanimously at that. That's right, Sharon. Sometimes they step up, and we get some good news from them. Other times, uh, not so much. Uh, do you support, Davis Parks, do you support substantive due process? This has always bewildered me. Whether or not you like abortion, it's always boggled me that this isn't a violation of the 10th amendment. It feels like telling abolitionist states that they have to honor a slave owner's right to property. I'll be keeping my fingers crossed that this means that the Casey precedents will be tossed and states will finally have their right to decide these controversial issues. So, you know, the substance, do you support substantive due process? I don't know how to even answer that question. I mean, it's such a huge topic that, that, that I, that I, that I really, I really can't, uh, unpack all of that right now. My head is sort of spinning, trying to think about how to even answer that question. But I think the, the bigger question is about sort of states' rights and about dealing with some of these cultural issues about whether or not we should set a standard. Look, look, regardless of what you think about the abortion issue, I agree that it, this is something that should be dealt with through the legislative branches. I think I think I, I would hope that most of us can agree on, about that. When we're talking about the courts sort of stepping into these cultural issues, I, got, I have a lot of issues with that. And this is where this is really where Roe versus Wade is so tricky, right? It's not it's not even necessarily from the the legal people. Many of us are not even such a tricky topic. I got to be so careful with my words here. Many of us are questioning the mechanism by which Roe versus Wade was implemented. OK, this was like the Supreme Court went in and passed a legislative bill. Essentially, they wrote law. Okay, which is not their function, regardless of what you think about abortion. doesn't matter. You can say, you know, this is about anything. It's about widgets or it's about selling fruit on the side of the street, right? There are some things that 
a, a court of law is intending to do. Its, its functions are directly tied to, to the creation of its jurisdiction, of its power, of its authority through our Constitution. So when the court starts acting like Congress, when they start passing laws like a, a three-structure frame for abortions— that has a, th a first trimester, second trimester, third trimester framework, we're all going, what? Where the hell did that come from? What, where in the Constitution did that say any of that? It comes from nowhere. So you're just manufacturing all of this stuff and then calling it you know, due process. And, and it becomes problematic because that's not the court's function. That's the legislature's function. So if the individual legislatures from all the different states want to pass their own rules and pass their own laws, I'm okay with that. Okay, I've been, I've been very in favor of that, that this is... One of the beautiful things of our country, we have 50 states, we have these little laboratories of democracy, as Justice O'Connor talked about, and that's a good thing. And people can pick up and go to where they want to go. And I really encourage that because we're seeing that happen right now. We're seeing this exodus from California over to Texas, over to Florida, over to Nashville uh, and uh, Tennessee and many other places. That's a good thing. That's a beautiful thing. I'd like to see more of that, not less. So great question, Davis Parks. Uh uh, good, good. Thank you for that. We got one or, or a couple more over here from Pinky Two says, Rob, seems like such a roller coaster. Why can't we get a state constitutional amendment to solve this court packing and a few others like term limits? Solve it using the people to decide. SCOTUS is too political and politicians forget who voted them in. Yeah, so uh, I'd, I'd be in favor of, of absolutely a convention of the states. Certainly. When we were playing around and toying around with the uh, the digital bill of rights, which I still like that idea if we can ever get some momentum behind it. But if, if we could do something like that, if we could get a convention of the states, we could impose some term limits. We could do a lot of things very quickly that would, I think, rattle the power structure in Washington, which is really, I think, what most of us want. We're kind of tired of the same old ineffective garbage leadership that, that I've had most of my life. We have, uh, and that is it for the questions. All of those came over from watching the watchers.locals.com. Thank you so much for all of your support. We really, really appreciate it.